the social dialogue forum between workers, government, and businessmen to reach consensus on other workers' demands and strengthen the national reconciliation began in Venezuela. Peruvian President Pedro Castillo submitted a constitutional reform bill to Congress seeking to activate a constituent assembly. Israeli forces continue the siege in the eastern occupied bank. Day one Palestinian citizen was killed and three others resulted seriously injured. Hi, this is From the South. I am your news anchor, Diego Martin, from the Telsur Studios in Havana. We begin with the news. The social dialogue forum between workers, government, and businessmen to reach consensus, honor the workers' demands, and strengthen the national reconciliation began in Venezuela. Representatives of the International Labor Organization, business associations, the working class, multilateral organizations, and representatives of the national government attended the meeting to conclude on April 28th. At the inaugural ceremony, the Director General of the International Labor Organization, Gay Rader, welcomed the high commitment given by the Venezuelan government to the forum. In her speech before those president, the country's Vice President, Delcy Rodriguez, stated the meeting could contribute to the growth of the Bolivarian nation to guarantee the workers' demands and to strengthen the productive sector. Bueno, yo decía... Well, as I was saying, in the midst of this scenario, the workers in Venezuela, the business sector, found a common purpose to move towards food production to guarantee food security and sovereignty for our country. We also worked hand in hand with the private sector to fight the pandemic. We had direct links with the private health sector with private clinics to create a single health program. I believe the distinguished representatives of the Director General of the International Labor Organization that this is also part of those spaces for dialogue. The Vice President also addressed the serious consequences to the salary and other fundamental rights of the Venezuelan working class caused by the sanctions imposed by the United States government. The blockade aimed at affecting the productive capacities of the business sector, and in general, we can say this external attack on foreign currency income was undoubtedly most detrimental to workers' wages to the whole payment system, which harmed the social benefits for our workers, specifically during the pandemic. Workers and entrepreneurs, as well as other Venezuelan sectors, could participate in the political dialogues in Mexico, according to Venezuelan Vice President Delcy Rodriguez at the opening ceremony of the Social Dialogue Forum in Caracas. And as you know, we are in a process of reforming the dialogue in Mexico to include more sectors so everybody feels included in these dialogue mechanisms for understanding, for a life of tolerance, for the development of Venezuela, well being of our people. In Cuba, President Miguel Diaz Canel attended on Monday the inauguration of the Bio Havana 2022 International Congress which until next Friday will gather delegates and guests from 51 countries at the Capitals Convention Center. During the event, key topics related to medical technology and Industry 4.0 will be addressed, such as chronic inflammation, cancer, agricultural biotechnology, and neurological diseases. The Congress aims to consolidate bridges between the business and economic sectors, in addition to strengthen the dialogue between scientists, technologists, and businessmen. The president of the BioCuba Pharma Business Group, Eduardo Martinez, spoke about the history of biotechnology in the country, emphasizing on the achievements of the industry. He recalled the optimum performance in the face of the worst pandemic humanity has faced on the 21st century. The development of technology and the pharmaceutical centers of our country have been recognized by the international scientific community and their preparation was what allowed us to respond to the health emergency derived from COVID-19. When the first cases arose and we began to study what was happening, the scientific councils were activated, our companies at the organizational level activated them, and we began to work very closely with the Ministry of Public Health. Haiti is on the brink of a new fuel shortage crisis. Although companies claim there is enough supply, long queues are still present around the gas stations. 
That is their scenario today in many cities of the country. Hundreds of vehicles are trying to refuel in the main cities, but the supply is getting tighter every day. However, the Bureau of Monetization of Development Aid Programs stated the stations have enough fuel to supply the population. Citizens blamed the economic agents for the fuel crisis created with the idea of forcing the government to authorize an increase in fuel prices, something that has happened in the past. Fuel shortages have become a common issue in the country in recent years. In Paraguay, drivers representing the Tobati Truckers Association continued protesting against high fuel prices and warned they will resume road blockades in the capital if their demands are remained unanswered. Most of the protesters maintained their mobilizations against rising fuel prices. Police warned about arresting those who persisted with the strike and road blockades. Security Chief Commissioner Daniel Cariaga explained since there was a possibility that protesters could have rallied towards the capital, that there will be an exclusive treatment for Asuncion, since all the powers of the state are located there. In the meantime, union leaders rejected once again the government's intention to deny an exclusive discount for truck drivers. Union leader Dario Tonyanes stated that around 500 trucks are moving towards the capital of the country. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. Peruvian President Pedro Castillo submitted a constitutional reform bill to Congress seeking to activate a constituent assembly. The proposal materialized after the announcement made by Castillo last week in a meeting with social organizations in Cusco and reflects the feelings gathered in dialogues with social leaders. In this context, the Prime Minister Aníbal Torres argued that the reform will have two stages, the first one being the referendum on whether or not the citizens want a constituent assembly which will be held simultaneously with the regional elections in October. The Peruvian Premier added that the Assembly will be made up of 130 members and will be popular, plurinational, and will have gender parity. Mexico updated its migration figures and it is confirmed by the National Institute in charge. More than 5,500 migrants from 40 countries have been intercepted in less than a week. The Secretary of State's office indicated that migrants have been found in safe houses, trailers, trucks for cattle transport, and compartments of buses in worrying conditions and piled up without ventilation, water, or food. Some people were also found adrift in the desert, mountainous regions, and the streets of the country after having been battered, assaulted, or abandoned by alleged human traffickers. The Mexican migration authorities reported that out of the 5,688 crossers accounted for, 3,645 are adults, 1,843 travel as families, 680 are underage, and of those, 200 are unaccompanied. Mexico is, according to the update in figures, the third country in the world to receive the most asylum applications. The United States began returning to Mexico Ukrainian citizens who had entered the country. In this way, civilian and migrant organizations and citizens of other nationalities awaiting authorization to enter the country protested the discriminatory treatment. Through the San Isidro Port of Entry in California, European citizens were returned to Mexican territory to apply for asylum through the Internet, as all asylum seekers do. In this way, the administration of President Joe Biden responded to the claims of several organized migrant groups who accused Washington of racist practices. The Ukrainian citizens forced to flee because of the war crisis in their country were surprised by the decision, saying it was not what they had been promised. For their part, migrants from Central America claim that it is the color of their skin that makes them invisible, despite the fact that they also come from countries at war. Well, they should allow us in because we are also fleeing, although for a different reason, gangs are almost as bad as a war. 
The plenary of the Chamber of Representatives is conducting a motion of censorship to the Minister of Defense, Diego Morano, for the that occurred during the military operation in Putumayo. This is the second. This is a motion of censor against him. Molano must explain the details of the military operation in the village of El Remanso in Puerto Leguizamo in Putumayo, in which 11 people died, among them an indigenous governor, a pregnant woman, and a minor. Although the police authorities deny the killing of civilians in the operation, at least 36 congressmen from different political parties support the evidence presented by local media that the operation carried out by the National Army left mostly civilian victims. In Colombia, also, a room of the special jurisdiction for peace called Recognition and Truth will hold on Tuesday, April 26th and Wednesday, April 27th in Ocaña, north of the Santander, the public hearing of those accused in the lawsuit number three, which investigates the false positives in Catatumbo. The decision to carry out the proceedings in Ocaña was adopted by the JEP due to the request made by the victims accredited in the case. There have been 16 preparatory meetings in which the transitional justice and those affected have collaborated to find the truth about the whereabouts of their relatives. The entity highlighted that there are 11 defendants in the case. Among them are 10 are from the special forces and one is a civilian. At the conclusion of the public hearing, the JEP chamber will have a period of three months to issue its conclusions before the section of recognition of truth and responsibility of the Peace Court. In Guatemala, junior high school students are promoting their native cultures and different social activities in order to preserve their identity. Let's see more about it in the following report. It is part of the cultural practices promoted at the Basic Cooperative Institute in Santa Maria, Teja, Ixcan, Quiche, to preserve the Mayan culture in the community. This is one of our principles and values. Our vision is that the culture of our ancestors continues in the same way, without losing its essence, because we see that with time, new forms of life are added, and sometimes we lose the essence of our culture. Language and the use of the Mayan outfits are practices that are strengthened on a daily basis. The white guipil represents the purity and beauty of the woman. The cut represents the four cardinal points, and the darkness, the napkins, the jackals represent the respect for the ajo and the respect for nature. They encouraged identity practices because part of it was lost after the genocide during the military dictatorship, which forced several families to take refuge in other countries. We had to take refuge in Mexico, and that implied that we forgot our culture in a way. But then we returned to our village, and we continued practicing the traditions of our grandparents. Although the indigenous culture is not relevant in curricula, teachers and parents in several communities are working to pass them on to new generations. We work on our culture to preserve it. We, teachers, see that it is necessary to maintain it. In all activities, we always emphasize it in order to promote it. Three indigenous peoples coexist in Guatemala, despite racism and discrimination. A majority of this native population maintains its identity. Rolanda Garcia, Telesur, Guatemala. We have more news coming up after a final short break. Please stay with us. Hi, and welcome back. Israeli forces continue the siege in the eastern-occupied West Bank. On Tuesday, one Palestinian citizen was killed and three others were seriously injured. The health ministry reported that 20-year-old Ahmad Ibrahim Oedat died after he was hit in the head by a bullet during an Israeli raid on a refugee camp in Aqaba Jab. According to the hospital dispatch, three other people resulted injured and one of them is in serious conditions. Meanwhile, Palestinian security authorities confirmed that at least seven people were arrested earlier on Tuesday 
during different military operations carried throughout the area. According to health ministry figures, in 2021, Israeli troops killed 355 Palestinians and injured 16,100 of them. President of North Korea Kim Jong-un vowed to speed up the development of the country's nuclear arsenal during a military parade displaying the nation's intercontinental ballistic missiles and other weapons. That parade took place on Monday night as part of celebrations for the anniversary of the founding of North Korea's armed forces. The head of state added his country will continue to take steps to strengthen and develop its nuclear capabilities at the fastest time, saying that their nuclear forces must be ready to be exercised at that time. Featured submarine launched ballistic missiles in addition to hypersonic missiles. In March, North Korea tested its largest known intercontinental ballistic missile for the first time since 2017, sparking wide condemnation from the international community. The United States also imposed several sanctions on the country after the test. The European Union warned about recent reports of violence in the southern east state of West Darfur and urged all parties to the Juba peace agreement to, to comply with their commitment to protect civilians. The European External Action Service recalled that all signatories of the Juba peace agreement bear a joint responsibility for the protection of civilians, as well as the creation and training of joint security keeping forces by the Sudanese armed forces. The Action Service also stated that armed movements under the peace agreement is urgently needed and need to be expedited. The European Union also expressed its readiness to provide humanitarian assistance to those in need and urged the authorities to ensure free, safe and unimpeded access for humanitarian organizations on the ground. The Russian Defense Ministry on its daily update reported that its anti-aircraft defenses intercepted two Ukrainian Tachka U tactical missiles, similar to those that killed more than 50 people at the Kramatorsk station on April 8th. The intended targets were populated areas in the east and southeast of Ukraine in the localities of Esvatono in Kharkiv and Tokhmak in Zaporizhia. These two missiles add to the 85 Ukrainian military objectives, which include 59 military equipment comprising armored vehicles and artillery pieces that the Russian Air Force destroyed in the last few hours. The Russian Defense Ministry confirmed having destroyed 13 drones, 37 command posts, and 114 fortifications. Since the beginning of the military operation in Ukraine, Russian forces have intercepted and destroyed 269 Ukrainian anti-aircraft missile systems. On Monday, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that there is a real risk that the conflict in Ukraine may trigger a Third World War. Lavrov made the statement in an interview with a Russian news media outlet. He said that the danger cannot be underestimated, for it is serious and real. The top diplomat of Russia said that since early March, Moscow warned that an intervention by the West could lead to a Third World War, destructive and nuclear. Lavrov recalled that in January, the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council ruled on the inadmissibility of a nuclear war a principle Russia has adhered to. Lavrov regretted that the warnings about sending weapons to Ukraine have not been heeded, stating categorically that if NATO goes to war with Russia through a proxy and arms with this proxy, then quote-unquote, all is fair in love and war. And Russian President Vladimir Putin held a meeting with the Board of the General Prosecutor's Office and pledged to ensure full support and stability to companies that continue to operate in the country, including foreign ones. During the meeting with the said entity, which has had to deal with an unprecedented number of sanctions intensified after the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine, the Russian president said both domestic and foreign entrepreneurs continue to fulfill their obligations in good faith. Putin said they'll be able to work peacefully and will be legitimately protected. The president asked to respect the rights of entrepreneurs and to guarantee them commercial freedom and flexible mechanisms. The head of state also reiterated his hopes that the Russian economy will be able to function smoothly under the new reality. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin hosted a meeting held this Tuesday in Rammstein, southwest Germany, to set the framework for military aid to Ukraine. At the meeting, also attended by NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg and by Defense Minister from uh, several European countries, the Pentagon chief said that the war in Ukraine has entered a new phase. 
After saying that Russia was not able to achieve its objectives, the United States General said that the purpose of the one-day meeting is to continue working together, making progress in the foreseeable future. Austin said that so far 30 allied countries have joined Washington in announcing aid to Ukraine in excess of $5 billion. A Security Council has been urgently convened in the Republic of Moldova, northern Ukraine, after an explosion occurred in the pro-Russian separatist region of Transnistria. There has been an explosion at a radio station broadcasting in Russian. The situation prompted the president of Moldova, Maya Sandu, to convene her security cabinet urgently. As confirmed by the press office of the presidency in the last few hours, two attacks have occurred in the area of Giropirupol in the Transnistrian region. The attacks have disabled the two antennas of a radio station that broadcast all its programming in Russian. On their part, the authorities of the self-proclaimed Republic of Transnistria have declared a red alert. We've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at Tell Us Our English. You can also join us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Tell Us Our English, I am Dio Martin. Thank you for watching.